a tax freight train is bearing down on your retirement. To protect yourself, you'll have to harness the power of zero. Hello, everyone. This is David McKnight. Welcome to the Power of Zero show. Uh, glad to have you with us today. We're going to talk about some exciting things today. Uh, we're going to be homing in on tax deferred investments. Should you do them? If so, in what uh, quantities, in what circumstances should you do tax deferred? Should you do tax free? Uh, so these are important questions when you're making these uh, decisions as you're saving and accumulating money for retirement, and they can have uh, pretty big consequences if you make the wrong choice. So let me start off by saying that really the, the number one decision, the number one piece of information that it should inform uh, your decision when it comes to putting money into a tax-deferred bucket or a tax-free bucket is what you think tax rates are going to be in the year you take the money out. Are tax rates in the year you take that money out likely to be higher or lower than they are today? That's all it really takes. That's just, that's all the information you need. Sometimes you go online, you see these fancy calculators and they tell you whether you should do a Roth IRA or whether you should do a traditional IRA. Well, guess what? I'm here to tell you that all of those calculators are a big waste of time because all you really need to know is a single piece of information. Are tax rates in the future likely to be higher or lower than they are today? Are tax rates, when you take money out of these accounts, likely to be higher or lower than they are today? Because that informs the math behind the decision that you're making uh, when uh, determining which account to do. So sometimes you'll hear this argument. Well, if I do a Roth conversion, in other words, if I take money from a traditional IRA and I pay the tax on it and I convert it to a Roth IRA, you will then have less money in your IRA, uh, less money in your Roth IRA account and therefore you will have less money working for you, and therefore you will have less money in retirement. Well, let's take two seconds to debunk this statement. And I hear it all the time, and I hear it from CPAs, and I hear it from people who otherwise are, seem like pretty well-educated people, and they come up with this argument. And uh, the, the way I explain this, and I think it's a pretty useful explanation, is as follows. Let's say that you have a million dollars in your IRA and you're in a 30% tax bracket. We're just going to use 30% just to keep our math easy. We could use 20%. We could use 15%. I'm going to use 30% to make my math easy. Um, if you have a million dollars in your IRA, how much of that IRA is really yours? Uh, well, some people say, well, on paper, it's all mine. Well, no, you got to remember that when you put money into that IRA, you entered into a business partnership with the IRS and they are joint owners in that account with you. You have a million dollars, but it's in, on the IRS's letterhead. So uh, if you're in a 30% tax bracket, you have a million dollars in your IRA, only 700,000 of that money, 700,000 of those dollars are really yours. Okay. So you may think that if you got 10% growth in a given year, uh, that that $100,000 of growth on that million dollars is all your growth. It's not all your growth because 30,000 of it is the growth of the IRS. 70,000 of it is your growth. Okay. So you got to remember that of that million dollars, uh, if 30% taxes is, is, is what you're going to end up paying on that, only 700,000 of that money is really yours. 30,000 of it belongs to the IRS. So as that million dollars grows and compounds over time, it's easy to get sucked into the temptation of saying, well, gosh, I, my, I, you know, I, I I've got a million dollars in there and all of the growth that accrued on that account accrued to me. So here's the point. If you have a million dollars, 30% tax, 700,000 of that is yours, uh, 300,000 of it belongs to the IRS. And when that money grows over time, that $300,000 portion, which belongs to the IRS, is going to grow and compound right along with your portion. Okay. But you got to remember that it's not really your money. It's growing and compounding for the IRS and the IRS loves it. Okay. Now, Let's say, for example, that you were to take that million dollars, pay 30% tax on it, convert it to a Roth IRA. How much do you really have right now? 
Well, once you get into the tax-free account, you have $700,000. So if tax rates are always going to be at 30%, and I know I'm sort of operating in a vacuum here, if they're always going to be at 30%, it doesn't really matter whether you do the Roth IRA or or Roth conversion in this case, or the traditional IRA, leave it in the traditional IRA account. Because in either scenario, you're going to have $700,000. You may think you have a million dollars on paper, but remember the IRS is a joint owner in that account. 30% belongs to them. Okay. So uh, so long as taxes stay at 30%, it doesn't really matter which account you, you, you choose. However, if tax rates were to go up just 1% to 31%, how much of the money in that IRA is now really yours? Well, it now went from $700,000 down to $690,000, okay? So because tax rates went up, your uh, percentage of ownership in that account went down, in which case you would have been better off doing the Roth conversion. Can you start to understand why it's so important to understand the fiscal landscape of our country like we talked about in episode one? It's so important to understand uh, what fiscal challenges our country is going to be facing over the course of the next 10 to 10 to 20 years. Because if you're planning on taking money out of these accounts, uh, even eight to 10 years from now, then you have to try to anticipate where tax rates are going to be because that, at the end of the day, should inform all of your decisions as it relates to these types of accounts. And you got to remember that these, you know, the purpose, the true purpose of a retirement account is not to give you a tax deduction. A lot of people say, hey, I got to get money into that IRA by the end of the year so I can get a tax deduction. The true purpose of a, of a retirement vehicle is to maximize cash flow at a period in your life when you can least afford to pay the taxes, and that's in retirement. Now, truth be told, if I had to choose between um, <clears throat> 700000 in my IRA or 700000 in my Roth IRA, um, remember I said it doesn't really matter which one you choose if tax rates stay level. I, I'm going to qualify that. I'm going to say that you have to remember that any distributions that you take out of your IRA – count as provisional income. Now that's whether you do a Roth conversion or just a straight distribution. It counts as provisional income. And provisional income is the income the IRS keeps track of to determine if they are going to tax your social security. Okay. So you have that $700,000 after tax in your Roth conversion. You take money out. It does not count towards the thresholds, which cause social security taxation. If you leave it, uh, your portion of that 700000 in the, 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 the traditional IRA, you take money out. Uh, that does count as provisional income. It will uh, potentially cause your social security uh, to be taxed. So getting back to... Uh, t- uh, traditional tax deferred investments. Um, there's all sorts of different investments that qualify. We're talking 401ks, we're talking IRAs, uh, we're talking 403bs, 457s, SEPs, SIMPLES. Your pension is technically uh, an example of a tax deferred investment. And they all basically have two things in common. The first thing they have in common is when you put money in, you get a tax deduction. But the thing that you have to remember is that you're getting a tax deduction at historically low tax rates, only to postpone the payment of those taxes till some point much further down the road, okay? And when you take the money out, at what tax rate are you going to be? Is it going to be higher or lower than it is today? Uh, Some people, and we hear this from the financial gurus all the time, they're going to tell you, Well, you're always going to be in a lower tax bracket in retirement than you were during your working years. After all, you're going to be living on less money, uh, so on and so forth. Well, I I think that there's been a lot of uh, financial journals that have debunked this idea that you're going to be uh, spending less money in retirement. Because as as, uh, my good friend Tom Hegna says, he says, what day of the week do you spend the most money on? It's a Saturday because you're going to Home Depot. You're you're doing getting your shopping done. Well, guess what? In retirement, every day is a Saturday. So you're going to be spending more money, more money than you ever anticipated. So that's one point I would like to bring up. But the second point is this. 
that all of the deductions that you experienced in your working years uh, literally vanish into thin air right when you need them the very most, uh, which is when? When you're retired. So for example, number one source of deductions, your house. A house is typically paid off by the time you reach retirement. So that's the number one source of deductions. It's gone. Even if you're 25 years into a 30-year mortgage, um, most of your money is going towards principal at that time. Very little is going towards uh, interest. So the deduction's gone. Number two is that is your children. Uh, you get a huge... Uh, child tax credit uh, during your working years. Your kids typically are not living with you in retirement, so that that child uh, child tax credit is gone. Uh, third thing is your 401k or other qualified plan. You are no longer contributing to your 401k in retirement, so that's a huge deduction that's gone. And then uh, we talk about the final one, which is charity. And what we found is that... Um, if you were charitable during your working years, you're likely to continue to be charitable in retirement. Only in retirement, there tends to be less money to go around. So instead of donating money, what do people donate? They donate time. So instead of uh, writing that check out to the soup kitchen, you may actually walk down the soup down to the soup kitchen and ladle the soup yourself, which is incredibly noble and worthwhile. But what does the IRS think about your time? They think nothing of your time. It doesn't even show up on their radar because it's not a deductible activity. So <clears throat> will you be in a lower tax bracket in retirement? Uh, perhaps, but probably not, especially given what we know is going to happen to tax rates January 1st, 2026 and beyond. We know that tax rates are automatically going to revert back to pre-2018 uh, levels, January 1st, 2020. Uh, 20 uh, 26. We know the year and the day when that's going to happen. But that's not really my big concern. My big concern is what all of these experts are saying is going to happen to tax rates most likely after 2026. As we move forward to 2028, 2030 and beyond, tax rates are likely to be uh, dramatically higher than they are today as the debt balloons up to $30 trillion. Interest rates return to historically normal levels. The cost of servicing that debt starts to crowd out all of the other expenditures in the budget. And and uh, of course, Medicare and Medicaid and, and Social Security are driving that debt up and just exacerbating the problem year after year. So the question becomes, should we completely avoid the tax deferred bucket in a rising tax rate environment? And my question, my answer for you is no. Uh, and, and here's, I think, something that you'll you'll not read in any other financial book. It's something that's really... Uh, peculiar to the power zero uh, tax paradigm. And, and it's this, and it's, it's mathematically borne out. In a rising tax rate environment, there is a perfect amount of money to have in your tax deferred bucket. Okay. There's a perfect amount of money to have in your tax deferred bucket. Uh, if you don't have a pension, the perfect amount of money in your tax deferred bucket is between Two hundred and fifty and three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And if you really want to home in on what the exact number is, you can go to my website, davidmcknight.com. That's David McKnight, M C K N I G H T dot com. And you can look at the magic number calculator. Scroll down uh about midway down the page, you'll find the magic number calculator. That will that will tell you uh based on what your rate of growth is, based on your um um, how much money you have in uh, various sources of provisional income. It will tell you exactly how much money you should have in your tax-deferred bucket. Remember what we want. We want the balance in your tax-deferred bucket to be low enough that the RMDs coming out of there at 70 and a half are less than or equal to your standard deduction, which if you're married is uh, $24,000 plus an extra amount uh, for a tiny standard deduction once you pass a full a a retirement age, which is at 65. Um, but we also want the balance in that bucket to be low enough that it doesn't cause your social security to be taxed. So if if your RMD were $24,000 at age 70 and a half, or let's call it, say, $26,000, because we got to remember they give you that extra little standard deduction once you reach, reach full retirement age, you could make the case that you could have five or $600,000, probably close to $600,000 of money in your IRA that would generate an RMD that was equal to that $26,000. But here's the problem. If you have $26,000 of uh, distributions coming out of your tax deferred bucket. It all counts as provisional income. And when added to one half of your social security will almost certainly cause your social security to be taxed. 
That's why we say if you don't have a pension, the perfect ideal balance is probably closer to two hundred and fifty to three hundred fifty thousand dollars, depending on what your social security is. Remember, we want distributions to be tax free, but we also want social security to be tax free as well. Now, if you have a pension, this is chapter uh, chapter eight of my update and revised version of the book. If you have a pension and it's a big enough pension, it's going to completely uh, take up all of your standard deduction, uh, in which case you probably don't want to have any money in your tax deferred bucket. So get that money systematically shifted to tax free. You remember, want to stretch that tax liability out over as many years as possible. Uh, probably get all the heavy lifting done before 2026 when tax rates go up for good. Okay. So, so general rule of thumb, and, and this is not something that we definitely have to look at your situation to see uh, for sure what the recommendation would be, but generally, you know, you want to have $250,000 to $350,000 in your IRA if you don't have a pension and you don't want to have any money in that IRA if you do have a pension. So I'm going to give you a quick quiz here and I want you to see if you can uh, guess my very favorite uh, tax-free investment. Okay. Um, let me just, let me qualify that. Give, I want you to guess my very favorite investment and, um, I'll explain what it is after we're done. So, um, remember when I make a recommendation for tax-free retirement, I, it generally consists of five or six streams of tax-free income. It might be a Roth conversion. It might be a Roth IRA, it might be a Roth 401k. Um, it might be your IRA, um, you know, up to standard deduction, um, you know, offset by standard deduction so that that RMD is tax free. Um, we talk about Roth 401ks. Uh, we talk about LIRP, life insurance retirement plan. That's also technically tax free. And if you can keep all of these sources of income below the provisional income thresholds, then your social security can be tax free. So if you were to guess of all of those things I just mentioned, what is my very favorite stream of tax free income? Well, my very favorite stream of tax-free income is the uh, RMDs coming out of the, that IRA that's offset by the standard deduction. And here's why. Remember, when you put money into an IRA or a 401k, you, uh, you got a deduction. You know, you got a deduction probably at uh, the highest tax rates you're going to see in your lifetime. And then what happened? You grew the money tax-deferred. And when you took it out, you took it out tax-free. So that's the holy grail of financial planning, folks. You get a deduction on the front end, it grows tax-deferred, you take it out tax-free. And by the way, if it was a 401k with a match, then you also got free money uh, to grow and compound inside that account. If somebody tells you uh, 401ks aren't a good deal, I would say put in up to the match, not a penny above and beyond, get that tax, uh, get that uh, free money. You will get a tax deduction on the front end, uh, grow that money tax deferred. And then if you can keep that balance small enough, you know, between 250 and 350 uh, in retirement, then you can use your RMDs to take distributions out of their tax free. So that is my very favorite tax free investment. I don't think you can beat a 401k with a match where you get the deduction on the front end, you grow it tax deferred, you take it out tax free. That is the best stream of tax free income. Nothing else beats it. Uh, mathematically, I can give, show you spreadsheets that, that make the case that nothing is better than that, that 401k or IRA, but especially the 401k if you can get the free money on the front end. All right. So in summary, folks, uh, Tax rates in the future are going to be higher than they are today. Do not neglect your tax deferred bucket. Remember, this whole process of getting to the 0% tax bracket is like trying to fit a bunch of puzzle pieces together. When you fit the puzzle pieces together, then the 0% tax bracket emerges. No one stream of tax-free income will get you uh, to the 0% tax bracket. It requires multiple streams of tax-free income, none of which show up on the IRS's radar, all of which uh, contribute to you being in the 0% tax bracket and the tax deferred bucket can play a critical, critical role in that whole process. Anyway, thanks for being on the show today. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thanks. Talk to you soon.